Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions, those who will be joining us live on C-SPAN today as well. We would ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to check that one last time that your cell phones have been turned off. It is always appreciated. We will post the program within 24 hours on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And our internet viewers and other viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Peter Brooks. Mr. Brooks is Senior Fellow for National Security Affairs in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. And he is a commissioner with the Congressional U.S.-China Economic Security and Review Commission. He is active in the media, making more than 2,500 radio and television appearances over the last decade, including on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, and NBC. He has also been a foreign affairs columnist for the New York Post and the Boston Herald for some 10 years. Prior to coming to Heritage, Mr. Brooks served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Affairs in the George W. Bush administration. He was on the Republican staff of the Committee on International Relations in the U.S. House with the Central Intelligence Agency, also at the State Department and in the private sector and defense firms. He was on active duty with the U.S. Navy and retired from the Naval Reserves as a commander. Please join me in welcoming Peter Brooks. Peter. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here in the auditorium and as well as online. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that I prepared for my moderating assignment today by uh, watching Zero Dark Thirty on the way back from China this weekend. <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, this is a very important topic, and I'm glad we're discussing it. A lot of agencies are looking at uh, their changes in the way forward, the future, uh, as term in terms of uh, the current uh, security environment and what they expect in the future. And in the post-9-11 security environment, the use of special operations forces has increased considerably. Special operators' combination of unique skills made them adept at combating terrorism and insurgency over the past 10 years, and we're thankful for that. However, as the U.S. withdraws from Afghanistan and attempts to refocus its national security objectives, the soft community intends to return emphasis to its indirect missions, those that strive to prevent conflict rather than engage in it. By working by, with, and through America's partner nations, performing exercises, humanitarian missions, and continuing to build relationships, our quiet professionals can provide critical components of national security. We've assembled a terrific panel today with long, impressive resumes, which I won't get into because it would take too long, but they're going to tell us more about the way ahead for the soft community. Joining us today is Captain Steve Wisotsky. He's the commanding officer at the Center for SEAL and SWIC, SWCC. Captain Wisotsky has had a number of operational and staff assignments over the years at home and overseas. Before his current assignment, he most recently served the Assistant Chief of Staff for Strategy, Plans, and Policy at the Naval Special Warfare Command. Captain Wisotsky graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy. Go Navy. <laughs> Beat Army. Beat Army. <clears throat> Come on now. He also studied Spanish. That's only for one day a year. He also studied Spanish at the Defense Language Institute and received a degree in National Resource Strategy from the National Defense University. Also joining us is Colonel Stuart Braden, Chief of the Expanding Global Soft Network Operational Planning Team, U.S. Uh, SOCOM. He also served in a number of operational and staff positions, as the captain has, at home and overseas in his career. He recently returned from a tour in Afghanistan as the director of the Special Operations Fusion Cell, a multinational joint interagency task force with 14 nations and eight agencies supporting NATO SOF. The colonel is a graduate of the Citadel and received a master's degree in Latin American Studies from San Diego State University. Last, Steve Bucci is director uh, Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy here at the Heritage Foundation. Steve served America for three decades as an Army Special Forces officer, as well as an assignment as military assistant to Donald, uh, D Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, uh, where we met, and uh, also serves as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in the George W. Bush administration. Steve is a graduate of West Point, go Navy, beat Army, received his master's and doctorate 
in international relations from the University of South, uh, South Carolina. He's also a graduate of the U.S. Uh, Army War College, the Hellenic Army War College in Greece, and a senior seminar of the State Department. I think we're going to start with you, Steve, and then we'll go with uh, the captain and then, and then the colonel. Okay. Over to Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to add my welcome to everybody that's here this morning. Uh, we appreciate you coming to listen to this very important subject. Uh, I'm the, the old guy of the panel, uh, so I'm going to give you a little history since I'm the closest one to it. Uh, I joined SOF in 1980, so that was a, kind of a long time ago, uh, when Army Special Forces had two missions. We did direct action, which was basically everything we did alone, unilaterally, or uh, unconventional warfare, which was everything we did with somebody else. Uh, it was a simpler life back then. Uh, direct action included everything from kicking in doors to carrying around little bitty atomic bombs, which I did a couple of times. Um, we don't do that anymore. Uh, it included reconnaissance, shooting, blowing things up, anything that American soft, and we weren't even calling it soft yet at that point, uh, did without anybody else around. Unconventional warfare was everything from training guerrillas to go behind the Iron Curtain, which back then we were still doing, uh, to training uh, countries' militaries to fight guerrillas, say in the Philippines, and all the way to counter drug operations all over Latin America. Uh, all of those things were included under the umbrella of unconventional warfare. To be honest with you, by volume and importance in the minds of the, the special operations community at that time, unconventional warfare was by far the most important of the missions that we had. It wasn't the direct action stuff. That was considered the, the one-off kind of things that we, we did because either nobody else was available or because we were the only ones who could get someplace to do something. Uh, and we looked at unconventional warfare the ability to work with foreign militaries, to learn foreign languages, to understand foreign cultures and move within them as what made us special. In fact, we used to joke, we'd say, you know, we were just the Army school teachers. Uh, and people would always say, oh, yeah, I understand, Bucci, you're, you, know, you bloodthirsty killers. And I said, no, no, really, we're, we just go places and teach other people how to do things. That's really what makes us special. Uh, well, then the world started to change a little bit. The, uh, the whole thing of terrorism started kicking up more and more. You recall in the Munich Olympics and then the Entebbe raid, uh, countries all over the world started developing what we now refer to as special mission units. Special units of the military, not the police, but of the military that could deal with these very high profile, very dangerous situations. Uh, and it, it gave rise in, in our community of the idea of black soft versus white soft. So the really special secret guys and those of us who are just sort of mildly special and secret. <laughs> um, and over time, uh, even though they initially started out with just countering terrorism and dealing with hijackings was really their first big mission set, uh, over time we added in things like counterproliferation missions, scud hunting during the first Gulf War, uh, some very special domestic support missions that we basically did until the FBI could pick up on those missions, uh, to, all the way to what we referred to for a little while as advanced unconventional warfare, which was really just really fancy direct action missions that we brought a couple of locals along to, to help where they could. Uh, but slowly that, uh, particularly post 9-11, uh, the direct action side continued to grow and eventually somewhat eclipsed the uh, unconventional war warfare part of, of our uh, environment. My old boss, Secretary Rumsfeld, in some ways contributed to this. Uh, he, he did at one point uh, after the war on terror began call in the commander of U.S. SOCOM at the time and looked at him and said, I want you to run the global war on terror out of your headquarters. That's where the focal point should be. That never occurred. That particular commander chose not to really pursue that mandate that was handed him uh, and stayed in the hands of the uh, various geographic combatant commanders. Uh, and then the other thing that Secretary Rumsfeld did, which was probably 
frankly, really added to this tendency of direct action over unconventional warfare was the idea that he saw those direct action missions, kicking in the door, shooting the bad guy in the head kind of things, as much more difficult, requiring much more expertise. So he said, let's not waste the special operations guys on these missions of just training other people, working with the foreign militaries. Anybody can do that. Let's give it, uh, keep these guys on these much more important high profile missions. Frankly, this led us to a situation where U.S. SOCOM, United States Special Operations Command, really, some people said pejoratively, had become a support organization for Joint Special Operations Command, the, uh, where all of the special mission units in our force structure reside. Uh, and they, they did a great job. They killed and, or captured a heck of a lot of high-value targets. They really uh, worked that end of the global war on terror. But there was an enormous cost to that, both in money and, and in sort of lack of balance, if you will. Well, the, one of the reasons we're here today is to point out that present, the present commander of U.S. SOCOM, Admiral McRaven, has, is trying to drag the community that he is now in charge of back to a position of what I think of as balance uh, in these. Uh, he is trying to return to the historical point of what made Special Operations Forces special. Uh, he is trying to reconstitute the community as a tool for the policymakers for engagement, for pre-conflict shaping, and early conflict uh, guidance for the, uh, the military and therefore for our policymakers. Uh, I will tell you, this is not a power grab on the part of U.S. SOCOM, though it's been portrayed by some people as that. They say, so this is just the special ops guys trying to get control and more authority and take it away from others. That is not what is going on if you really read the documents coming out of U.S. SOCOM, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks, Heritage will have a paper out that will enumerate this and, and describe it in ways that hopefully are a little more digestible by the general public and hopefully by our legislators. Uh, that that's not what's going on, nor is it SOCOM going into a defensive crouch and trying to protect its assets and the, the gains that it got during the, the uh, post-9-11 period at a time when budgets are shrinking and, and uh, many in the services are trying to protect, you know, the Navy's trying to protect ships, the Air Force trying to protect airplanes, the Army's trying to protect brigades. Uh, this is not what, what SOCOM is doing. I really believe this is a visionary return to the roots of the community with an, an acknowledgement of the present day situation that we are running short of assets. The world is more dangerous than it's been before with a lot of diverse potential threats out there. And SOCOM is offering our policymakers ways to address those threats at a very low level with a very low footprint uh, in ways that can hopefully diffuse those threats before they, they turn to violence, before they turn to, uh, into bigger crises. Uh, it is a way that will lead to an improvement in, in effectiveness. Uh, and I will add one caveat at the end before I turn it over to, to Steve, uh, that the only danger in this policy that SOCOM is pursuing is that our policymakers will love them too much and will decide that they are the answer to everything that uh, is going on and will use them in ways that will cause them to be thrown into a situation finally where they are really not the right answer and you get a whole bunch of really highly qualified, highly skilled folks killed. And I hope that doesn't happen. I hope that uh, the leadership in SOCOM will be successful in this drive but will also maintain the ear of the policymakers so that they are used when they are appropriate, where they are appropriate, and not uh, extend them beyond what, uh, where they're ready to go. And with that, I'll turn it over. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Yep. Thanks uh, very much, Steve, for uh, <coughs> letting me come here with you guys. Thanks, Stu, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> my name's Steve Wazowski. I work in San Diego near the headquarters of the Naval Special Operations Community. I kind of wear two hats right now, one Navy hat and one uh, Special Operations hat. With my Special Operations hat, I focus now on 
the the men and women in the naval special warfare community who support U.S. SOCOM, who are in the Navy, and their education, professional development, leadership development, and things like that. Throughout my career, though, I've been closely aligned with Stu and, and the rest of the uh, special operations uh, components. So I also have a lot of uh, experience and a lot of passion for the, uh, the global soft network that, that Colonel Stu Braden is in charge of right now. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, wh where the Navy has been, Navy Special Operations, Naval Special Warfare Community has been, and where we're going now, and uh, segue into Stu's Global Soft Network discussion. Um, <clears throat> when I came into the, uh, into the SEAL teams in 1988, was uh, shortly before we deployed to Saudi Arabia. Actually, we deployed, yeah, we deployed to Saudi Arabia for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I was one of the first guys on the ground with some Rangers. Mm -hmm. And that was a really interesting introduction to, to the world that I had just uh, entered into. And it opened my eyes to a lot of um, how important Arabic was, how important the understanding of Islam was, how important it was to see the world through the country that was hosting you, and how effective it could be if you were able to do that. So that was a, a really good intro for me to um, be a, a lot more uh, sensitive to those things. And I've tried to carry that with me throughout my career. <clears throat> right now, uh, so, so th at that time, we were focused, like uh, Steve said, on, uh, we, were, we were in the, in the SEALs, so we were really focused on maritime, direct action, very unidimensional type things. We didn't really have a good sense of uh, unconventional warfare, uh, training the, the G-Force, uh, you know, a lot of the things that are the bread and butter for the Army Special, Special Forces guys. Over the years, though, um, especially since post 9-11, uh, the guys and gals that work for Naval Special Warfare have really, really come into their own in the non-kinetic world. Um, all of our forces have uh, advanced light years uh, in all of, the, uh, all of the mission areas. Uh, CT, DA, but more so in the, uh, the non-kinetic uh, world. We're partnered everywhere with our partners from the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force, and even more interestingly with our partners from the interagency, uh, State Department, AID, CIA, and the rest of the uh, U.S. interagency. When uh, Stu, Stu's time in Afghanistan uh, recently, uh, I preceded him there running the soft fusion cell, and um, as he mentioned, there were 12 other countries, eight other different agencies, and that was a, uh, an incredible rainbow coalition of um, foreign, uh, soft men and women, operational intelligence uh, people focused on a single task in Afghanistan like I had never seen before. And we were kind of the, uh, you know, the, the showcase for a lot of uh, joint interagency, foreign, soft uh, coordination there in Afghanistan. And it had, had effects, had really, really, uh, uh, positive, significant effects, and it continues to. Um, within the Naval Special Warfare community right now, we have a huge uh, foothold on land. We've been um, in, a, in Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11. That has had a, had effect on our, mil, our maritime skills. We're known, we're expected to be the premier maritime special operations force in the world. And I think we still are alongside a lot of our soft, maritime soft counterparts. But I have to tell you, after 10 years plus of most of our guys in, in landlocked countries or close to landlocked countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, the skills, the high-end skills in the water, under the water, on the surface, have, uh, have atrophied to a large extent in our theater special operations forces. Now that we're looking at the, uh, the end of uh, Afghanistan, pulling out of Afghanistan or in a large way, we are able to rededicate ourselves to the maritime realm like never before, both uh, under the water and on the surface of the water. So that's one real interesting uh, area that um, the SEAL teams are focused on and the special boat uh, teams that we have that, that, that where our special warfare combatant craft crewmen operate, our special boat operators. Um, the uh, other thing that I wanted to mention is the uh, the human capital. We, you know, s since 9-11, the signature of the special operations, and especially the SEALs, um, much to the chagrin of most of us, has been a lot higher. Movies, books, not always the right, uh, right message being portrayed. But it, it's attracted a lot, of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of high, highly talented uh, men and women to our force. Um, so we've got an incredible uh, 
bank of talented guys right now uh, still coming in the doors that are we are able to uh, do things with like never before. The enlisted, the NCOs coming into the SEAL teams now um, have, many of them have four-year degrees, a couple of them have master's degrees, our last graduating class from our basic uh, training. 60% of the, uh, the enlisted guys had, had college degrees and two had master's. So um, the demographics of our force is uh, changing. They're coming in with expectations of, of the, uh, the post-9-11 combat world. The reality that they're facing in many cases is a little bit different than that, but their talents are such that we can align them and uh, train them to do the hard jobs of the future, many of which are going to be uh, non-kinetic in nature. Um, so that's where I, that's what I'm working on right now. General S Bennett Sokolik is uh, down in Tampa working for General, working for Admiral McRaven, heading up the uh, Force Management and Development Directorate. Part of that, part of his charter is education, talent management, and preservation of the force and family. So where I come into play now in San Diego is is in the Navy Special Operations world, taking advantage of uh, the combination of the highly talented uh, guys and gals that we have in the community and are coming into the community, and then trying to offer as many challenging education leadership uh, opportunities for them to meet the requirements of, of today post-Afghanistan. And those, those opportunities are less and less traditional military uh, edu educations like the Navy Postgraduate School, Army War College, Navy War College. But we need some of our men and women to be extremely uh, conversant and extremely collaborative with the interagency, with our foreign soft allies. So sometimes that means uh, sending them to other institutions, both in the United States and overseas mixing seamlessly with, with the people that they're going to be working with, with that they're going to be depending on for, uh, for success uh, in the special operations world overseas, and uh, doing it uh, sometimes in the native language, sometimes with a, with a deep understanding of the culture as well. Um, so if I had to say that uh, one area that we are focused on more than ever, it is, it is striving to increase the collaborate, continuing to increase the collaboration with the interagency, and with our foreign soft allies. I just came from uh, San Diego a few days ago, and we had a huge, uh, we had a fairly sizable symposium of all of our foreign uh, naval maritime special operations guys out there in the, in the uh, training area where I work, collaborating on uh, undersea uh, tactics and, and equipment and things like that. We haven't done that in a long time. And these are the guys that have been doing it for, for a number of years while we've while the Navy has been running around on the land in the mountains of Afghanistan. So we've got a lot to learn from those guys. And we're not going to, it's not going to be a U.S. only show in many of these countries. We can't always do it successfully with a U.S. face. So we uh, are working by, with, and through, as Steve mentioned. We're building partnership capacity with these guys, and um, it works. And uh, our guys that know a little bit of the language that can go overseas and uh, work with the, uh, the foreign soft allies in a uh, comfortable, credible way, uh, comes back to us more than double. Um, you see it down at the headquarters with Stu. Our LNOs down there at SOCOM are, um, are collaborating more in a more substantive way, uh, being allowed into the, uh, into the briefings like never before, and their badges work, and they're up on the systems, and uh, it really works. And our growing global soft network is, uh, continues to grow. Our special operations liaison officers are moving overseas with their families, embedded in the host nation uh, headquarters, um, and it, uh, it works like never before. So um, I'll turn that over to Stu to continue that theme. Thanks. Thank Hi. You. On behalf of uh, Adam McRaven, Steve, and the foundation, I want to thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come and talk. I think this is wonderful. I apologize for my boss not being here. He's coming off a week of well-deserved leave, and if you've ever been around my boss before, leave is not leave. It just, he can answer emails in his civilian clothes at his leisure, but uh, it's very difficult for him to unplug at his level. So again, thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Uh, I am the operational planning team chief for the global uh, operational planning team. And um, when Admiral Craven took over in August of 2011, um, the administration was in the process and in, in the final stages of releasing the defense strategic guidance. And uh, during the, his in-processing or 
you know, they asked the Admiral, how did he think that soft should be postured in support of the defense strategic guidance and, and you know, looking forward to 2020. Um, the Admiral formed four operational planning teams. Mine was the one that was designated to look at several different areas. Uh, I was chartered to determine how we would posture and build a global soft network. Um, if you come down to Tampa, what we do is historically, before we give you a briefing, we show you a movie and we show you real world vignettes of all of these uh, disparate entities all over the globe and how they're globally connected to show you what the threat environment looks like. And, and it gives you a better understanding of why you need a network to defeat these types of networks. Um, but one of my primary tasks was is to take a look at the theater special operations commands assigned to each one of the geographic combatant commands and figure out how SOCOM could best optimize those commands to better support uh, SOF in 2020. Um, I was challenged with uh, developing a, a strategy on how we would, SOCOM would better interact or thicken our, our support inside of the interagency and how we would do that. Another critical piece to what we're trying to do. Um, and then my boss, I, was, I spent several years at with the NATO Special Operations Coordination Center. Um, I was the first guy there. And, and, and in large part, what that did is it gave NATO a special operations component. It had a land, maritime, and air component. And when it came to special operations activities, NATO just did it as a pickup game. Whoever volunteered to be the lead nation for that is how it worked. And that is just fundamentally not how you go to war. And in today's environment, when you're dealing with networks and flatter, faster, you know, uh, enemies out there, you've got to have something that not only exists, but it's more capable and flatter uh, so it can respond to those types of threats. And we have created what originally was called the NATO Soft Coordination Center, and it evolved into a three-star headquarters now commanded by Vice Admiral Sean Pivas, and it's now called the NATO Soft Headquarters. And my boss wanted us to take a look at that entity and see if we could do that like activities in, in other parts of the world and stuff. Um, I was also to look at uh, building networks or the communication systems that ensured that we could tie in the networks uh, with our international partners and make sure we could do the information exchanges and sharing. A couple critical things had to happen first. I mean, you know, when you, you know, everybody thinks that Stu Braden had a, you know, a degree in this, you don't. There's, not often do you get to tackle something like this. And we went out to the intelligence community and we said, hey, what will it look like in 2020? And they basically will come back to you and tell you that they five years and in, they're pretty good. Anything beyond that, they're kind of just making stuff up. They can't, you know, the <laughs> accuracy is not there. And so we had to be intelligent. You know, we had to say, okay, well, you know, let's look at, uh, you know, we looked at a lot of reports and stuff. And we looked at things like urban to rural flight, um, we looked at water uh, population densities. We looked at education. A lot of these are different reports. So we went to RAN and the think tanks and academia. These are basically spreadsheets buried in some academics report that people skim over and no one reads. And what we <laughs> said is, well, I mean, they're all great indicators of exactly where future friction points might be. And if you take a, a good look, a hard look at where those friction points might be, then it kind of can lead you to an area where you think you might, you know, be utilizing soft in the future. And one of the key things for us is we wanted to capture all that data and we wanted to be a, able to geospatially depict it so you could juxtapose it against it and you could merge several of the variables together to see if you could kind of, you know, lead you in the direction of where you possibly think there's conflict and stuff. Um, and I will tell you, it's not easy to do. It was very hard to do. We did it. We just updated it. I saw it last week uh, before I went on leave. Uh, and it, we kind of updated every six months. But it gives you an indicator, an idea based on certain variables of where you think um, we should be postured and not where we are postured. Um, the other thing is, is we had to go out to the geographic combatant commands um, who owned the Special Operations Headquarters. You know, Special Operations Command had zero command relationship with the theater special operations commands. We had none, none. Um, and so for my boss to communicate and collaborate with those theater special operations command, he got permission from the geographic combatant commanders. And in uh, April of 2012, we pulled them all down to Tampa and we spent three weeks in there grinding out um, how they, the theaters, 
thought soft should be postured. Um, again, what we asked them to do is a couple things. We said, we want you to give us your three top priority regions. You got to prioritize them. You know, everything's not a priority, which is, again, hard to do. And inside of each region, you had to prioritize everything, all your requirements. And then we also wanted to know the periodicity. Do you want the assets for a week, a month, three months? We had to make sure that this could withstand the scrutiny of Congress and OMB and everything else. We wanted to ensure that what we were doing was rock solid and we could defend it. Um, three weeks of our lives, we'll never get back together. You know, which is, it's not going to happen. I mean, it just was very, very hard to do. But once you do it once, I think it's, you know, you can, you can do it quickly after that. Uh, we juxtaposed what they, they thought was, you know, the answer to the strategic variables I just mentioned. And you would be shocked at how similar everything matched up, which was relieving because I think it saved us an additional two weeks um, that we might have had to work through to get that. Um, so what did we get out of all that three weeks? What we got is we, had, we were able to enumerate the global combatant commander's soft requirements. You know, we have a big map. It's 34 feet by 30 feet. Fill this room. Uh, we made them put a pin on the map of each and every requirement in each and every region. It's a bit old school, but when you do that, it forces you to think through exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish. I think one of the key takeaways from this is uh, we were able to enumerate all the special operations requirements um, that were out there. And I think that's quite huge because historically what we've done is we've looked at all the requirements regionally and we haven't looked at it holistically and we haven't ensured that we're looking across the seams where all these networks tend to operate and we, you know, are kind of constrained by our, you know, unified command plan. And so SOCOM, in its role as the global synchronizer, was able to look holistically at this. And this is the first time. Um, we were also able to kind of grind into it and get a little bit deeper than we have been. Uh, we are about tomorrow. We will be almost done with our second uh, year of this. We do this annually. Um, and we'll have the theaters come in tomorrow evening and on a teleconference and, and validate this one more time. Uh, but our intent is every year to revalidate it. And it's okay. You know, we fully expect the requirements to change annually, but every year we want to be able to enumerate what the theaters want and need and why they need it. And then we want the theaters to be able to pass that back to the chairman in writing so that the joint staff and OSD know exactly what those theaters want. And the beautiful thing about it is if you look at the map and you see all the pins in the world, none of those pins were placed there by SOCOM. Those are all things that they are requesting special ops do in support of the geographic combatant commander. So that was a huge, huge piece in part. Um, in regard to building out what we are calling the regional soft coordination centers, you know, the Admiral said, hey, take a look and see if this was feasible at other locations. In the spring, I think it was June of 2012, we have what we call International Soft Week in Tampa. Uh, we brought in 94 different nations uh, for a week, um, and we break them up into different seminars and what we do is we kind of lay out different concepts and ideas to kind of see where we're going and see what, you know, the regions think is important and stuff. And so um, one of the big things that they all thought was, was, was worthwhile is having a regional soft center along the lines of the NATO soft headquarters. I mean, it's different because they have an alliance piece. But, I mean, the reality is, is they thought something that was educational and training so they could get interoperability. Uh, that's a word that we tend to, you know, just blow by. It's extremely important at the tactical level. If you don't have interoperability, you get people killed. Um, and that's something that you, you know, you think that we were better at, but we're not. And everybody identified that as a need. Information sharing, everybody felt that, you know, having folks there to, to be able to pass information and share information to make sure that we were all, you know, at least if nothing else, deconflicting. We'd love to get to synchronization, but if we were de deconflicting different types of things, that would be a plus and a and then the last thing is the human relationship. I mean, you know, um, a lot of what we do is based on friendship. We've known our foreign partners, you know, for 20, 30 years. I mean, I vacation with a lot of them. I mean, we are personal friends. My <laughs> kids and their kids grow up, you know, around each other. I just spent five years in a multinational headquarters. So um, it's, and, and we do things together all over the world, not just in Afghanistan and Iraq, but we find ourselves, you know, involved with these same folks and so we have personal relationships. And, and the biggest theme that you, Admiral Craven is trying to push as we build out the global soft network is, is you can't surge trust. You know, 
if you want to th have things function in a global soft network, you have got to make sure that you have personal relationships with the people that are on the ground. And you don't get that by a 20-day visit or a 30-day visit. That is a persistent presence where you're able to build a relationship with one of our key partners and allies that allows us the ability to help them and to help ourselves. Um, we think in addition to that, it gives our nation much more credible uh, options when it comes to crises. Um, but we also think that the focus is, you know, in accordance with the defense strategic guidance, is to work with our key partner nations uh, to help them solve regional problems, to preclude regional problems from becoming major theater <coughs> operations. That's the preventive word. Inside of the Department of Defense, we refer to it as phase zero shaping and phase one, which, which is, uh, what is phase one, Keenan, remind me? Deterrence. 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 I have to have my PhD <laughs> professor with me everywhere. I apologize. I, I went to a state-supported school, so I'm not as smart as <laughs> <laughs> these two guys next to me. Um, but, it, we, you know, this is where the defense strategic guidance is. is. And, I mean, um, if we, I mean, if you've ever been to war and you've seen what's transpired over the last 11 years, it's amazing what our military has done. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tribute to our nation. Uh, the reality is, is that strategically we've got to spend as much energy and effort in prevention as we do fighting these wars. And so, and that is the big shift. Um, we used to do these. Our intent now is to look at them um, from an operational lens and not a training and readiness lens, which is what we kind of did before. And so uh, in the, we are in the process of delivering a campaign plan to the Joint Staff and the Secretary. Uh, my boss will meet in September with his, uh, his geographic uh, combatant commanders, uh, and their intent is to do the final touches on this before it's submitted up to the Joint Staff. But I think uh, what we've done is we've been able to enumerate uh, the soft requirements out to 2020. We're going to bring all of that into the joint operational planning process, the APEC process there that the Joint Staff and the Department of Defense knows and loves. Uh, and it'll allow us to move forward all with the intent of providing the geographic combatant commanders with the soft requirements that they want. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Good. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, we're going to move the question and answer now, but I had a, a question as the prerogative of the, the moderator here. Is I was curious, and I don't know if anybody can address it, as to how we're obviously very concerned about sequestration here at Heritage and defense spending. And I don't know if any of you are involved in that at all, but I was kind of wondering how sequestration is affecting your operational planning. Or is that above your pay grade? I'm not a great, I mean, I'm, I'm like Steve here will tell you this thing. I avoid the budget discussions, frankly, <laughs> because I'm not that smart. My wife does all the, the money for us at the house. And, and if you were around me, you'd know. Um, uh, I mean, it, it does have impact. I mean, but at the end of the day, I mean, you're never going to have enough special operations. There's a cut line of people and dollars. And so um, whatever the, the, the nation decides is, you know, what they want with special ops is what we're going to go with. Um, it will require us to adjust the plan, but I mean, I mean, the reality is is that uh, we have a credible force. It's, it's, it's deployed quite a bit. I mean, significant, uh, significantly. I don't know if we'll, you know, we're not going to be able to do everything that we wanted to do, but I mean, that's a reality. I mean, you know, there's just not enough money to do everything we want to do, and we're never going to have enough people to do everything we want to do. So I, I do think Adam McRaven and the staff could give a much better answer at that than I am, but... Okay. I mean, it will impact us. Okay. The, the uh, one part that's going to affect them is as the military writ large draws down, the community from which they recruit for special operations is smaller. Yep, our team pool. Ev everybody that's in the special operations community comes from the rest of the military initially. So if you have a smaller pool, you, you know, that eventually starts affecting these guys. I think, though, the, the thing that I – left as a, as a warning, you know, not to be loved too much, uh, will hopefully work in favor of special ops, and particularly this administration likes Special Operations Command. They like the kind of things they can do, so hopefully there will be some degree of protection. It won't affect them too much, because at a time like this, with smaller budgets, with, you know, smaller military, SOF is, is going to provide you more bang for the buck or more, you know, pound for pound more effectiveness than, than the conventional military, particularly at this, the phase zero, phase one events. 
I will tell you that um, special operations community is not immune from the cuts. We've had a lot of really, really hard uh, discussions, and there's going to be some hard decisions looming uh, that will affect special operations. Uh, personally, one of the hardest things I've had to do recently is sit down with all of my civilian government service employees and discuss with them the, the furlough. Uh, that is ongoing now through the end of the fiscal year. That's that's a really tough conversation. I've got some employees who are, um, you know, close to living paycheck to paycheck, and to tell them that they're going to have to uh, take a significant cut, and at the same time we're working so feverishly on preservation of the force and family. It's a, it's a it's a tough uh, conversation sometimes. So that's one of the real uh, uh, difficult personal ways that's affected me. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Let's move to question and answer. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, we'll bring you a microphone. Uh, stand if you wish. Uh, please give us your name and affiliation, uh, especially if you're a member of the press as a courtesy to our, uh, to our speakers. George Nicholson with Strat Corp. I go back to special operations from 1968, working with Blue Light. When we stood up JSOC, I worked for General Dick Schulte. A question for you, Steve. The big discussion going on between the Commandant of the Marine Corps right now, General Amos and Admiral Greener, he talked about it initiatives of going ahead now of putting MARSOC assets on board uh, the ESGs or ARGs when they deploy. In the past, when I used to run around with Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Joe McGuire in Central America, you all used to have SEALs on board the carrier battle groups, and I think going on the ARGs. Are you looking at going back to that capability? And as part of that, under the last QDR, you now have two, I guess it used to be HH-60 units, I guess they're MH-60S units right now, that support you. How are those being used? Are you looking at enhanced capabilities for them that are greater than the current uh, force of MH-60Ss that the Navy has? Also, the last thing going on right now, when we did the requirements for the CV-22, there was a requirement in there for 48 V-22s to support the Navy, to do COD support, CSAR, and support the SEALs. That was backed up. Right now, there's a large push on the Navy going ahead and getting V-22s to replace uh, the COD aircraft. Has there been any kind of dialogue with you all if they get that, you know, how they can support you? Also, if we could just stick to one question <laughs> to give everybody a chance who may have a question, we'll try to definitely get around to a second round. So I'll leave it up to you what you want to respond to there. I can answer the Marine Corps one because I was a well, that was, that's one I was going to take. Go for it. <laughs> uh, the easiest. The first question about getting back onto the ARGs and the General Amos and uh, Admiral Greener discussion. Um, it would be a mistake to say that we're going to go back uh, to the way we used to do it, uh, but we do need to have a strong relationship with the special operations. Needs to have a be embedded with the uh, the fleet and the amphibious uh, na naval forces as well. But that doesn't necessarily mean we have to put a large contingent of troops with all their kit for long deployments. So, I think what you'll see is something like uh, a smaller, tailored team of guys, uh, probably called uh, at first an integration team, uh, special operations network integration team, maybe an intel communications, and some type of uh, officer, 05, maybe 04 eventually, uh, to, to lead that team, to be the, the belly button for that ARG, uh, MUSE, MUSOC, uh, Amphibious Ready Group, ESG Commander, to special operations uh, command, and the TSOCs through whichever uh, GCC they're passing through but we're not going to get back into putting large numbers of guys back on the, uh, the ARGs. Stu, do you have something to add? Or we just ran a, we ran a one-week okay. war game, and we brought down the Commandant and the Vice CNO, and it's exactly what Steve said. It's, you know, the, the reality is, is we want a small entity on, on board with the Muse that can tie into the broader special ops community because, you know, we have a tremendous community, and we want to make sure that we get them the right assets and stuff. And so that's the direction that they're going to head. And I think everybody walked away with that feeling completely comfortable that we, that, you know, the Muse would have the access they needed to get the right capabilities they needed. Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Michael Krause, been a soldier, uh, no longer young, two wars, four continents, five contingencies. Recently come back from a six-month business deployment from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and have been to all the GCC nations. My question is going to be on those building relationships and the continuance of those relationships. Observation, the kingdom does not yet know it is under severe threat. The balcony of the kingdom is Bahrain. It is under threat daily. 
uh, the ministers of the Arab states, ministers of interior, have met, and one of their priorities is counterterrorism, counter drugs, second one. Uh, third one is illicit immigration. 3,500 Yemenis cross the border into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia per day. My question is going to be, in the interagency process with foreign, presumably partner states, how are you working with those ministers of interior and their sub-elements to advise, to prepare, uh, in terms of leadership training, their uh, capabilities to face impending chaos? Do you, is that to any one individual or to the panel in general? Uh, to whoever would like to, uh, okay, to bite on to that. I'm sure there's a lot there to chew. Okay. Okay. I can speak in very general terms. You know, we, we uh, over the last, uh, since 9-11, since we have invested heavily in our relationships with the countries in the, in the Gulf states, Bahrain being one of the main ones. We have a huge uh, presence there, huge special operations presence there. We have a joint special operations task force uh, GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, there, whose efforts are largely on phase zero, phase one operations, building partnership capacity with all those countries in the region, uh, including the Yemenis, with whom we've made some huge uh, inroads recently, both in the military and the interagency world. And we, we, uh, we work through them. We don't impose, uh, we don't tell them necessarily how to do things. We respond uh, to what they need, and it's tailor-made. It you know, under under uh, commander of uh, CENTCOM and Special Operations Command, Central Command, our teams, SF ODAs, MARSOC, MSOT, SEAL platoon, SEAL squads, uh, Special Warfare uh, boat team detachments, are heavily focused on working with each of those governments. Uh, usually, it's with a DOD nexus or a MOD nexus, but. More and more, there's a lot more Ministry of Interior and host nation interagency play because it can't be it can't be you know singularly a, a military effort. Um, uh, so generally speaking, it's it's uh, SOF is, is in the lead in many ways uh, in that in that world. We're definitely not blind to that issue. Steve, this this is what you've enumerated is exactly the reason Admiral Craven wants to move his command in this direction. This is the world we're living in right now. It's not just in the Gulf states. It's all over the world. Uh, and frankly, the people who are best at going in, moving into that culture, because you can't just come in. You know, it's kind of like the difference between when your kids are little guys and when they're, they're adults. You, you can't treat these countries like they're little kids, where you just come in and say, oh, here's what you need to do. Just go ahead and do it. You've got to go in. You've got to advise. You've got to, to get to know them or they're not going to listen to you. And you could have given the best advice in the world, and they won't take it. But if you build the relationships, if you do this stuff ahead of time, if you prove your worth to them as a friend and a colleague and an equal, which is what the soft community is so, so good at, then when the crisis starts, they'll take your advice, and they'll be prepared to deal with the crisis. So this is a, the situation you described is exactly what Admiral McRaven is, is trying to get ahead of so that we have people in place with those relationships to deal with these situations. So when he says you can't surge trust, uh, that, those are, you know, we walk the walk as well. Um, mm -hmm. That's a nice catchphrase, but in order to do that, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a really concentrated focus. And it means some version of regionalization, having the same guys, uh, familiar faces go back to the same embassies, the same formations of troops, spe speak a little bit of the language. Arabic is a tough language, so um, maybe we don't have a lot of fluent Arabic speakers, but a little goes a long way. Understanding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way uh, that Yemen, the history of Yemen, or the way that, you know, these, these Gotta young be their friends. soldiers, yeah, so it really makes a difference, and it's reciprocated, too, so when we invite, when we get to that day when we invite the Yemeni uh, LNO to uh, headquarters SOCOM, he will know who he is, he'll bring his family over to Tampa, his kids will be going to schools there, and he'll be allowed into the, uh, the operations center, he'll have a badge, and 
um, it'll be a it'll be a pretty comfortable relationship. So we're trying to do that every everywhere we go because it really works. Back there. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Tinder. I work with the Air National Guard in strategy. Started out in the early 70s in special operations flying AC-130 gunships. That was a SOCOM in the early 90s, so a little bit of background there. Uh, the question I really have and, and what caught my interest it was the uh, discussion about partnerships and relationships. Uh, as you probably know, the Air National Guard as well as the National Guard as a whole is working on building partnerships, and they have mm -hmm. approximately, I, I think, in the area of 70 state partnership programs with overseas folks. So my question is, is there something going on that somehow would join the two programs, the SOF program, as well as what the National Guard is trying to do, realizing also that the Guard has a very small slice of the pie with respect to this SOF world. Thank you. I'll take that. Okay. I mean, what you'll see is um, everything that we're doing is in support of the theater campaign plans from each of the geographic combatant commanders. So inside of each one of those regions, this is a holistic look. So SOF is a part of that. It's not the sole entity that's operating. There's all types of aspects in there, just inside of the Department of Defense. And then from the country team perspective, none of these activities done by DOD is done without the approval of the Chief of Mission, who is then looking at it from a country team perspective, and he's looking at it from a whole of government interagency aspect. So it is, I will tell you, it is very well deconflicted at the tactical level, you know, folks on the ground. It is not very well synchronized at the higher level. It is to some degree, but I mean, you know, young people on the ground tend to work through all the dynamics and make things work extremely well. What, we, what we're trying to do as we, as we build out this campaign plan is to try to make sure that we don't have redundancy. We can do a little operational deconfliction at our level uh, and I think be a little bit more efficient at how we do things. But I, I, the answer to your question is yes, all this is a part of the country campaign plan from the chief of mission and the geographic combatant commander. Over here, I'll, I'll get you next. I'm, some of these people I can't see as well, but I'll, uh, I'll get you next, but we'll go over here first. Uh, afternoon, uh, my name is Thomas Gibbons with uh, the Washington Free Beacon, formerly 1st Battalion, 6th Marines. Uh, my question for you guys, uh, you gentlemen, is uh, how do you see you know, a lot of argue, a lot, many people argue that uh, big army, the conventional forces, have become a highly specialized um, force as a whole. Where do you see soft playing into uh, the conventional forces' growth from here on out? Is that directed to anybody in particular, or just the panel? Uh, Steve? Uh, I'd say, you know, they're going to continue to be in support of the larger conventional forces. That part of their mission set's not going away because they're emphasizing this stuff. So, you know, should we go to war with, with a larger portion of the military again, they, they'll be soft along in front of them, around them, doing all the things that they've always done. Uh, in, in the Marine Corps in particular, you know, you, you guys picked up some soft capability since 9-11 um, and are using that both in support of SOCOM's missions but also in support of the, the Marine Corps in general. So I think you'll still see that level of synchronization between the conventional forces and, and the soft forces, which is a good thing. It, it, neither group can do their mission as well as they would, would be apart when, as they do when they're together. Steve, could you preview your paper? So I know you wanted to have it done for today, but just to let folks know what your the The, the, the main focus of, of our paper is, is that SOF is moving in the right direction, you know, and part of that is not, you know, giving up all the old missions that they've had over the years, but shifting the focus back to a more balanced approach of this uh, phase zero, phase one type capabilities, getting the people out there in the, the world, doing these missions ahead of time, and in some cases that involved a little what some people perceive as stepping on the toes of some of the geographic combatant commanders. Some of the ambassadors were a little nervous about this. Uh, and Admiral McRaven has done an incredible job in all of his staff, you know, assuaging people's fears and doubts to let them know that, no, this is not something nefarious. You know, SOCOM is trying to do the right thing to support these people in their missions. And I think he's gotten, uh, in large measure, the buy-in and the trust that he needs. And hopefully that'll continue. And if not too many people in Washington tinker with it and try and help, uh, we'll <laughs> probably get it uh, done fairly well. But hopefully that paper will be out here in the next uh, week or two. 
I can convince my boss that the way I'm writing it is correct. You have uh, a title we'll for it? Uh, we're, we're holding on that. I okay, don't sounds that good. Yet. I'd like to throw one oh, thing yeah, in sure. there. Just, I mean, our interface with the conventional force, even from a JSOC perspective throughout the entire soft enterprise, I think has never been as good as it is right now. Uh, war will do that to you. Um, but we see our support for the battle space owners in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we see the, the activities that we're trying to do as we build out the global soft network, the same but we see the, ge the geographic combatant commanders as the battle space owners and the chiefs of mission as the battle space owners. And our intent is to give them the very best special ops support that we can give them. And I mean a very focused and deliberate level of effort. Um, and I just think that we, we will be fine in that regards. Um, I, it is different though. I mean, you know, putting such an emphasis on phase zero and phase one um, is, is, is new. It's not completely different. We have done it before, but we've, again, like I said earlier, we have always looked at it from a training and readiness perspective, and this is different. So from the, in the Navy, in the U.S. Navy, um, never before have we seen uh, the level of collaboration uh, with the big Navy, just like a uh, big Army, big Marine Corps. So since 9-11, uh, since we've had more and more uh, upwardly mobile naval officers be part of our soft formation. So this means now we have COs of ships and COs of F-18 squadrons and admirals, uh, submarine admirals, and other high-ranking flag officers who know soft because they did a tour of duty there. They did a tour of duty at the headquarters maybe or with one of our SEAL teams overseas or as an individual augment. So there is a real familiarity now and a respect, a mutual respect, and an understanding that, that you can't uh, overstate that helps uh, – us a lot. So uh, we have only a few, n not that many SEALs. We depend heavily on the non, uh, on the big Navy enablers, the general purpose force enablers. And those normally, those people normally go uh, out back into the big Navy and uh, that hu pays huge dividends for us. <clears throat> You've been waiting very patiently over here. Hi, uh, Erica Miller. I graduated from the Naval Academy in May and I'm currently TAD. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, we'll get you back in December. Army guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm TADing at the Institute for Defense Analyses before graduate school and then I'll join the submarine community. But uh, we've been working on a project and so you talked about how you can't surge trust and we saw that especially in Iraq and Afghanistan with the counterterrorism teams in particular because they were incredibly successful after 2005 when like you said war brought them together and they'd finally figured out what they were doing. So now that we're not going to be constantly at war, or at least those counterterrorism teams are not going to be acting in the same capacity. How are you institutionalizing those lessons learned and those best practices and promulgating those to the other agencies that are part of those counterterrorism teams? Do you want me to answer that? Did you have direct that to anybody in particular, the panel? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Stu, you want to I take mean, it? Uh, not to sound cavalier, but our 9-11 started long before 9-11. Um, and so for most of us, and you know, there was, you know, if you hear Admiral Olson, he talked about stress on the force, and I can, you know, it, it has been there for a while. The biggest difference, I think, is in the rotations at war, you know, uh, the deaths and casualties, uh, you know, change the dynamics, mainly the, the focus on the families, as Steve can speak to better than I. Um, I think um, as far as the counterterrorism team, I think everybody has elevated their game exponentially. I was in a multinational side of the house, and I, Steve can tell you that if you go to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, from the breach point in, I think our key partner nations are as good as any operator we have. And I mean that in all sincerity. Um, it's the, the things that the U.S. does that's a little bit different than everybody else is we're able, we have an incredible intelligence platform, we have incredible aviation assets, and we can bring the entire joint machine to bear on an X on a map. And it's nothing, it's not, I mean, I, if you'd have asked me 30 years ago when I joined this military, could we have done that? And I would have never guessed we could have. So I personally have watched my community evolve like nothing I've ever seen before in my life. And that's just strictly from a direct action side of the house. I will tell you that, um, you know, we've got an awful lot of young folks that are out there living in small groups with their locals. Um, and that is impressive. That's also probably one of the most dangerous things you'll ever do in your life um, because there is, you're a long way from help, a long way from help. And so um, the fact that they are able to execute that daily is quite impressive. And so I, I think the lessons learned are being captured. 
I think we're building the global soft network to ensure that there's persistence, that we actually don't stop collaborating. I went to a, uh, in 2010, before I went over to relieve Steve in Afghanistan, I went to, uh, to visit a counterterrorism uh, group international meeting. And uh, the biggest fear of the, the 05 lieutenant command, commanders and lieutenant colonels was is that there would be de peace declared and everybody would go back to their cylinders of excellence and the communication would dissolve. And that was their number one fear. I think uh, with the intent of, of institutionalizing and getting the Global Soft Network out there, I think we do a lot to prevent that. I will tell you, though, you have to work every single day at a relationship, and this will be no different. And just uh, to add to that, not quite as optimistically as, as Stu, but within the U.S. government, my concern is th those silos of excellence are pretty darn persistent. And as soon as the pressure is off, there's going to be a lot of folks in other parts of the government who are going to want to go back to business as usual, at least what they perceive as business as usual. Uh, and if we don't actively pursue that kind of coordination, which I think is what SOCOM is doing, uh, we c there's a real danger of us going back and forgetting all this stuff because we've realized, i got to tell you, the, the hardest fight was not trying to convince DOD that they needed help from other parts of the government. It was trying to convince the other parts of the government that they had a role to play on the battlefield in th particularly this kind of conflict uh, because they weren't used to it. They didn't have the personnel for it. They didn't have deployable people. They, they, it just wasn't their game. And, you know, they learned it was their game. And, you know, I hope we don't lose that. It is a very, very perishable set of skills and perceptions, though, that if we don't work at it, could go away, and then we'll be relearning it all over again the next time. So my question is mostly how are we institutionalizing those lessons so we don't lose them? Uh, well, well the, what, the few things that have been mentioned are some of the ways that we keep the, those relationships from atrophying when the sense of urgency of combat is no longer there or not as present. W w one of them is the RSCCs, the Regional Soft Coordination Centers, the NS, the NATO Soft Headquarters-like entity and HGCC tailored to that respective uh, geographic area that keeps an organization together, a joint interagency uh, soft focus organization together with strong relationships. That's that's one way. Another way is the is the exchange of, of LNOs and Special Operations Liaison Officers, U.S. Guys living overseas, embedded in the host nation headquarters, with their living in the country with their families, speaking the language, uh, going to work every day, not at the embassy, but in the host nation special operations headquarters, keeping that relationship going, and then reciprocating here in the United States with foreign soft LNOs, top uh, performing individuals from their countries living in the United States with their families, with access to the right briefings and the right rooms keeping those relationships going. So instead of an ad hoc uh, random acts of touching or you know a team going over to, uh, to train for a few weeks and then coming back and never talking again, we have a, more of a concentrated, synchronized effort and more of a method uh, to the madness. So. I, I think right now we have uh, 11 or 12 folks out living it. We're going to 40 U.S. living with our partners. Uh, in my team alone, we have 11 international partners. I think we're going to go add another 13 over the next year. I don't know the exact number. And it's not, you know, we're not going to be living in a coalition and village environment. They are actually, we, we are de-skiffing an area and we're putting them right in the center of the SOCOM headquarters command. And so and that is groundbreaking. <coughs> it makes a lot of people nervous. We're doing it within the rules and regulations, but I will tell you, it is a tremendous task to, to accomplish. Let's take one more question if we have one right back there. Hi, my name is Richard Barrett. I'm a 17-year-old homeschool student with interest in foreign policy and counterinsurgency. Now, um, as you've been talking about this new program with the Admiral McRaven's initiative, will we be seeing any kinds of programs such as the Afghan Local Police Initiative, like have been uh, done in Afghanistan, will we see kind of more bottom-up security, it's our service training um, across the globe? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just that, actually, yes. I mean, what you're seeing is a security force assistance, building partner forces out there. Um, the, depending on what country team, you know, it's the, there is concern about, you know, doing the, the military side before you do the, the diplomacy side, and there's always a, a, a catch there. Uh, you know, I'm a believer that you won't have good democracy without 
good security and stuff. Um, and there is a there is a balance there. I mean, it's because sometimes it can get a little bit interesting out there because the world is not all black and white. Uh, but yes, the intent is to uh, build our partner forces um, that are our counterparts and that we can work through our counterparts. You guys have any last thoughts on the on the on the issue before we conclude, Steve? Uh, I I just like to say this this is a rare opportunity. We have a, a confluence of, you know, the the active fighting part of two major conflicts that we've been pursuing for the last 10 plus years are, are starting to wind down. Uh, people are looking for efficient ways to maintain security without having to deploy thousands and thousands of young men and women around the world. Uh, you have a commander in what, in my mind, is the key headquarters for this sort of thing who has a visionary approach, who has an understanding that it isn't just let's do it the way I like to do it, it's let's do it in the way that's going to be most effective for the nation and, and for the, our military and in many cases for our partners. Uh, and we have a, a large cadre of younger people both in the military and in civilian clothes in our government who've seen this work. And while they're not the decision makers yet, you know, hopefully all the old nearsighted guys like me will die off and, and those young people who've had these positive experiences uh, will rise up and, and recognize, hey, in this situation, what we really need is to get a couple of soft guys in here to work with us. You know, we can get a lot more done if we don't keep them out, uh, and we'll get that kind of attitude. So I'm, I'm hoping that the nation doesn't miss this opportunity to really set the conditions for some positive movement forward so that we don't have to fight big wars anytime in the immediate future. Uh, that we can hopefully short circuit as many of those as possible and do this stuff at the lower level where it's it's a lot lower cost uh, both in lives and in, in money. Captain, Colonel, you have any final thoughts? I think we have a good strategy. I think it, uh, the new defense strategic guidance is rock solid. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, something that's we can definitely achieve. What we're trying to do at SOCOM is we're trying to operationalize that to actually get in the execution mode to do that properly uh, as our civilian leadership wants us to do. And uh, again, you know, um, we appreciate the opportunity to, to bring this out to the, and put it in public discourse. Uh, for those of you, there's a handout that will be much more articulate than myself. Like I said, I went to a state-supported school. I apologize. <laughs> Your tax dollars did not help me. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I just take that handout, and if you have any questions, you know, be happy to answer them later. Thanks. I'll say that uh, most of the things, a lot of the things that people see when they see things about special operations or when they think about special operations are the sexy, high-vis, uh, you know, killing Osama bin Laden type missions. That is such a very small percentage of what we do. Uh, Ninety percent of our efforts are on avoiding uh, kinetic action. Um, Every day, our guys and uh, men and women are in many different countries trying to avoid uh, conflict, trying to empower the host nation so that we don't have to uh, go into any, any countries and uh, conduct combat operations. So if I had to leave you with one, uh, one thing, that's, that's it. And when you think of special, we're not the special operations uh, of the movies. We uh, are trying to avoid conflict. That's where our primary investment is. And it's a lot harder to do that than the kinetic counterterrorism mission. The CT mission is something that the U.S. forces are really, really, really good at, best in the world, but it's relatively easy compared to the other, uh, uh, other missions that we spend most of our time on. It's an investment in time. The panel's done a great job today. I guess my only disappointment is that we didn't have any PowerPoint. I mean, how can we have a <laughs> DOD <laughs> event without PowerPoint? But uh, You've, it was a terrific briefing, really, and uh, you've given us a lot to think about um, on this very important issue. Thank you all for giving us time and traveling here to discuss this with us, and thank you for your service. I have to say, in this country, we're blessed to have so many brave Americans uh, willing to go in harm's way in support of our national security, and just a few of them are with us today, but there's so many more of them out there, so we are very blessed in that way. And um, maybe we can give them a round of applause to thank them for, for your time. I give the Army guys a hard time, but I have a son who's a captain in the Army, so it's just... Uh, I'm liking him more. <laughs> <laughs> so just one day a year in Army-Navy, it's uh, go Navy, That's beat Army. But thank you all for being here. The, the program is adjourned.